So governance, uh, so I put here the foundation of an effective financial crime framework. And I guess what, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, what does that mean? I think it, what I'm trying to say here is if you get the governance right in your financial crime framework, then everything else should lead off. So, I'm going to give a sort of an overview of what a financial crime framework looks like, uh, and then looking at corporate governance, particularly in, in, uh, in the financial crime framework. What the regulatory expectations are in around corporate governance, and uh, I'll talk about the corporate governance code and the board responsibilities. And those are what the FCA expects, what the PRA, PRA expects. Um, but it's also, you know, that you know, there is a bigger world than just financial crime. Um, but you know, those do relate to a, a number of different things, and I'll be quite general about that. I'll then talk about some skilled person reviews, and if you don't want a skilled person reviews, I will explain. Don't worry. Um, and you know the failures that you know the FCA and, uh, and our firm have seen in firms um, across uh, across the industry around corporate governance. And then lastly, I'll talk about uh, MI and reporting. Um, so potentially, uh, before I move on um, and move on to what the financial crime framework looks like, can anyone apart from obviously governance, can anyone tell me what other the key components are? of a financial crime framework. That's me trying to gauge the knowledge of the room rather than you know, a test or a test thing. Okay, that's fine. So, this is a typical financial crime framework as I see it. Uh, it's very subjective, so um, you know, one can argue that things could move around, but ultimately this is how I see a, you know, a, a typical financial crime framework. It's probably worth noting that whether you're HSBC, um, you are better now than you were before, or a uh, small pin services firm, this, these are the key components that you need to have to have an effective financial crime framework. And obviously it just depends on the size of your bank, then obviously that depends on, or, the, or firm, sorry, then obviously it depends on, on how big or in depth that control may be. So I've got governance at the top, because, but governance, Sits at the top, isn't it? It's an overarching, overarching component. It's very important. If you get that right, it then filters down really into everything. Um, you've got your risk assessments. That's you, you know, your firm understanding where your inherent money laundering and terrorist financing risks are. So, you know, an inherent typical risk is if you're a bank, um, I am a criminal, and the risk is that I bring my hard-earned illicit funds into the bank. And, um, and then I'll draw onto those proceeds of, of crime through the, through the bank. So that's an inherent risk. So the risk of, you know, what is the risk of money laundering if there's no controls? The risk assessment then goes into, you know, what sort of, um, you know, what kind of controls do you need in place to mitigate those inherent risks, which then spits out a residual risk. And that residual risk will sort of give you a, an idea of where you are from a risk and control perspective. So, is your risk um, too much uh, so that you know your controls are not working effectively? Do you have to bolster your controls to then limit that risk overall? Policy and procedures, exactly what it says on the tin there. You know what's what's your what's your policy around uh, dealing with uh, sanctioned uh, individuals? Um, you know, what's your policy around how many pet clients that you want listed to those persons, etc., etc. Again. You know, governance is an integral part of that policy procedures because ultimately it's the, the guy at the top that needs to be setting that policy. You know, they, you know, not just a, a bunch of old guys sitting around the table and saying, yeah, yeah, that's fine, no worries, no worries. Actually, they are important in making sure that, that policy procedure is exactly what that bank or firm needs. People, very important, that uh, training aspect, you know, building up people's knowledge and awareness of money laundering, uh, and obviously then subsequently the controls needed to mitigate that. Due diligence and ongoing monitoring, so uh, as Gabriella talked about, the CDD aspect, you know, know your client, the ongoing monitoring, so, you know, obviously individuals, you know, I opened a uh, bank account with uh, NatWest when I was 14, um, in, that, in those, 17 years, um, you know, I've, I've obviously changed, and obviously that ongoing monitoring of you know, what sort of expected account activity, you know, how are you monitoring that, you know, 
suddenly, you know, I'm not buying Lego anymore, I'm buying late time drinks out in Platinum, wherever it may be. Information and data management, information is key. Uh, you know, how you, how you obtain that information, use that information to your, um, to your power and your needs is really important. Escalation investigation, so if there is a risk, if, there, if you are seeing something uh, unusual, suspicious, how are you then escalating that from, say, the first line up into the second line, the money laundering reporting officer? Um, and then obviously maybe even up to senior management and then even uh, to the NCA potentially. And advice and support, so what, um, you know, you have the horizon scanning, how are you benchmarking yourselves against other firms? And um, using, you know, consultancies like, like me uh, to try and gauge, you know, what they're seeing in the industry and how you're measured against them. And ultimately, lastly, monitoring. You've got to make sure that all of these controls are working well um, and making sure that they're always fit for purpose. As your business model will change, so too will um, your risks. And if your risks change, your controls need to change. So, from a corporate governance perspective, what does that mean? Right, so, this is a, uh, this shows how basic my PowerPoint skills are. Um, so there's four real major aspects of corporate governance when it comes to financial crime from, from my perspective. They've got accountability. You've got to, the senior management have to take ownership of, of the controls. Um, you know, when the senior management, being managers and certification re regime, SMCR, uh, if you call it, was created, it was basically the FCA saying that for a long time, senior management did not take enough responsibility and accountability for the controls in that firm. So the FCA are really wanting that top level ownership, for them to be accountable for any you know, risks that the firm might be taking on or the control failings that, that Gabriella took. They want senior managers to be taking that responsibility and accountability. Culture, paramount to the success of, of, of your framework. Um, there's gotta be an attitude of doing the right thing. It's not just about Right, how can I make sure the FCA stay off our back? How can I uh, ensure that the, um, that you know, my firm isn't just gonna get slapped with a fine? It's about actually wanting to understand what the real, what the real things are, you, you know, why are we doing what we do? You know, I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago at, um, at the ACAMS, the certification that uh, Gavin had talked about. I was in Berlin the other day and I was talking, um, and they were talking about, actually, it's not just about telling, doing what the regulator tells you to do. What, what we're trying to understand here is actually, what are we trying to stop? What are we trying to prevent? It's very easy to say AML is just a way of you know, compliance, getting involved in business, and they're preventing business. You know, it's actually trying to understand what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to stop you know, drug traffickers entering the financial system, and the, which then obviously can then create a bigger business for them. You know, human trafficking is a big issue that we've got in the UK from Eastern Europe, and you know, we're trying to stop that. If you cut off the money, you cut off the crime. And that's what's really key about the culture, and not just ticking the box and say, yeah, we're FCA compliant. It's actually, what do I want to do? What do I want to do to help? Um, you know, it's, always, it's like having a, a morals, you know? It's not just making a buck, it's actually trying to understand what we're trying to achieve here. And Andrew Bailey, the chief exec of the FCA, said uh, last year, he said positive culture goes right to the heart of what firms and their staff are, what values they represent, and the positive ethical custom. Now to help with all of this, you've got to have an important tone from the top, which I've just spoke about earlier. And again, that goes beyond just sending an email around every year saying, make sure you guys do AML. It's about actually showing the firm that you are you know, willing to, to, to set that hard tone. It's senior management stepping in and say to you know, a business individual who doesn't really, it's not too interested in the AML, he's actually saying, right, you're no bonus this year because you didn't take your training on time. You, um, you had too many failures when you were completing AML, whatever it may be. It's gotta be that hard tone. And funny enough, tone from the top is actually now, it's there across the industry, it's a lot of firms are doing this very well now, especially the bigger firms. But what we're not seeing, 
is the toe from the middle, and that's sort of now a new buzzword, is replace toe from the top, because the execs and board get it, they get it. But if you're looking at the heads of businesses, you know, heads of business units, uh, or heads of teams, that middle management tier, who sort of run it day to day, do they get it? I'd argue that a lot of firms actually don't, and a lot of those individuals don't. So it's got to have that sort of tone from the middle as well as the top. So risk appetite is obviously very key as well. Again, the top guys, that you know, that's what they're there to do. They set that appetite. Um, you know, how many, how much business do they want to do with, uh, you know, customers like Coca-Cola or BMW, who are big corporate clients, but also obviously have a lot of sanctions exposure. So how much exposure to jurisdictions such as Iran and uh, North Korea, countries like this, how much exposure do you really want to have with that? How, what kind of transactions do you allow? Now, it might be quite healthy appetite, um, or you know, how, much, how many high-risk clients, how many clients from Nigeria do you want in your books? Now, I work with a large Nigerian bank who has a subsidiary in the UK, who are understandably under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. Um, you know, and 95% of their book are high risk, because 95% of their book are individuals and corporates from Nigeria. So it might be that your business model and your risk appetite is actually very high, but what you're gonna do is make sure that all those controls that you know, I sort of pointed to earlier, you know, you've gotta make sure that those are pretty, pretty bloody robust, otherwise, you know, you're not gonna be too, you're not gonna look too good. So from a regulatory expectations perspective, um, it, it's, it's not new, this corporate governance, we've been talking about it for, for a while, and, and um, yeah, it's been around, and the FCA and PRO have been, been you know, forcing on the firm for a while, but there's definitely an increased focus from the FCA and the PRA on rela relaying their sort of expectations on the boards and promoting good corporate governance, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on how they're doing that later. Uh, yeah, the PRA of doing, creating these supervisory statements, um, but the UK regular also tries to set that tone as well. What are they, what are they trying to achieve? Um, you know, not only just what they want firms to do, but they're actually saying, right, well, this is our own internal corporate governance. They themselves are conducting reviews on, on you know, a number of sort of reviews of how their corporate governance are working. They've done, you know, the FCA was created in 2013, um, and they've already had three reviews done. It was 2014, 2017, and, and last year. Um, the board governance is central to corporate governance, uh, and we're seeing this as a recurring theme in requirement notices in the SCIN's section 166s, which are and skill cluster reviews, which I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, later. So, the UK corporate governance code. People aware of the corporate governance code? Yeah. yeah. So, just so quickly, obviously, the, the aim of the code uh, is to improve corporate governance. Uh, and practice and stimulate constructive challenge in the boardroom and improve culture and trust in the workforce. And if I'll say, I'll say it a number of times, the word culture is uh, something you might hear once or twice a day. So the, the, the code is applicable to all companies with a premium listing, um, whether it's incorporated in the UK or elsewhere, uh, and um, was affected as of the 1st of Jan this year. There's five key sections of the code. So it's leadership and purpose, the vision of responsibilities, the composition, succession, and evaluation, audit, risk, and internal control, and remuneration. Now the FLC, the Financial Reporting Council, have looked to almost shorten and sharpen the previous code, which was it, it, it was in uh, 2016. Uh, so from a workforce and stakeholders perspective, you know, the sort of changes that they made was uh, there was a new provision to enable greater board engagement with the workforce uh, to understand their views, uh, trying to understand better around the Section 172 of the 2006 Companies Act and making sure that's effective. Culture, again, uh, boards are asked to create a culture um, that uh, aligns the company values with uh, strategy and how to assess and uh, how they preserve that value on, uh, over a long term, rather than just you know the sort of you know the culture snap. You know, people send around a message or there's posters, whatever it may be. Um, how is actually long term value culture is embedding that good good governance, a good culture 
into the company. From succession and diversity, um, there's got to be that sort of mix uh, of skills and uh, experience to have in that board to ensure you've got that sort of constructive challenge. Um, to, and that also includes maybe refreshing boards on a, on a number of times as well. Even if, if you keep the sort of board fresh, then you bring in new ideas. And again, as I talked about earlier, um, the industry is so fast paced, uh, it comes as quick as I'm talking. Um, but you know, you've got to keep up to date with you know, what, what's happening in the industry. Is your board still fit for purpose? Do you need more uh, diversity, whether it be from an age perspective or a gender perspective, whatever it is? Remuneration, um, you know, how many times does the uh, Daily Mail uh, talk about you know, top exec bosses uh, at big banks about their huge remunerations, their big bonuses, how well they're doing when actually the rest of us aren't doing as well. Um, so it was put in there to try and understand about uh, you know, addressing that sort of public concern, giving a bit more transparency uh, about what's how that remuneration has come about. You know, after the 2008 financial crisis, there was huge outrage because these big banks' bosses were making a huge amount of money. Um, but yet, the rest of us all, you know, really struggling uh, because of actions they had taken, their risks they had taken, but yet, somehow, they're still doing very well. So, it's a big sort of trying to understand and trying to be better around, uh, you know, using more remuneration committees uh, to better be to be more transparent. And from a, from a high quality reporting perspective, um, yeah, avoiding the tick, the tick box approach, you know, complying with provisions which may be justified in particular circumstances based on a range of factors, including the size of the business. So there's a number of sort of, re sort of reviews here that we've done. Um, so, you know, for example, Bank 4, uh, so this was something that we worked on at BDO. So the FCA had been there a number of uh, times, and it's still just, they weren't getting it right. The financial crime compliance uh, system controls were continually bad. They kept getting feedback letters from the FCA, the FCA's, uh, I'm sorry, the firm's getting feedback letters from the FCA. The firm would then say, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this. They'd come back and visit them a year later, still not got it right. So, Enforced with a section 166, feeding over the skilled person. Um, and obviously, they, what they did is they uncovered significant governance control weaknesses within the firm. And as I mentioned earlier, if you get those wrong, sorry, well, I mentioned earlier, if you get it right, then the rest of it should filter down into your systems controls. If you get it wrong, then again, it goes the opposite direction. So, a number of sort of um, areas in it. Actually, if I remember. If I remember correctly, actually, that was, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, actually, the case study, but it's, yeah, uh, some pretty serious sort of un uncovering some failings from a, from a bank's perspective, from their sort of top level of senior management, which led to a number of controls which is not working. Um, so this is a typical uh, sort of management committees, or what you might sort of expect in a bank or in a, or a firm these days. And obviously, this all depends on the size. So if you're a you know, really tiny firm, you might, you might not have a board risk committee. Um, or if you don't have a, a huge sort of inherent money laundering risk, then you may not have a financial crime risk committee. So it's all dependent on your firm. But this is sort of typical to what we're seeing these days because financial crime is now, you know, 10 years ago, credit risk, uh, was some term, I've been working in the industry for 10 years, but so I'm told 10 years ago, Credit risk was at the top of the agenda. That's what people cared about. It's what the board were always worried about. Credit risk barely makes the board payments these days. Having sat in a number of board meetings of some fairly large banks, financial crime is up there with the top risk. That's what they're most concerned about. Because of the fallout from the regulator and the reputational damage of getting it wrong, that's what boards are really trying to improve on. Cyber risk, obviously, also huge, huge, uh, and that's sort of the number one risk, if you like, now uh, to firms is that cyber risk. So this is a typical sort of escalation of committees. Uh, so your financial crime risk committee usually governed by the money laundering reporting officer, sorry, not governed, chair. Um, and you know, what they do is they, they receive that sort of initial MI from the bank of the inherent risks, controls, how things are working, how many clients are they onboarding, which are high risk, or how many pet relationships they're getting. They might also use this committee as a sign-off committee. 
So you know, if they need to sign off for policies and procedures or sign off of uh, high risk relationships, they may also use this one. Up to the sort of board risk committee. So again, that's more sort of wider than financial crime. Uh, but again, they're sort of there to challenge the risks that are coming through from the financial crime risk committee um, and sort of assess the level of the assurance of the controls in place. Uh, and then up into the board, who obviously, as I mentioned earlier, they're there to set the tone for the risk management. They're the ones who are setting the risk tolerance, the risk appetite. They should have ultimate responsibility for risk management uh, arrangements at the, at the firm. Um, so again, they'll have the report sort of filtered up, and they'll make the key decisions. So they'll, as I said, they'll set the risk appetite. They'll need to be signing off the financial crime prevention policy. Maybe not the procedures. Uh, prevention, you know, the procedures are more operational. You know, so the policy is about me is why why we do it, um, and the procedures more if you like how. So a bit more operational. Um, but ultimately, they're the top. And usually, what we're seeing nowadays is actually the MLRO who's chairing this uh, is actually now getting a seat on this on the board now. And that's a big sort of thing in the industry is actually. The MLRO needs to be taking responsibility. So just very quickly, MI and reporting. Um, this, is where, this is where a lot of firms get it wrong. They're not providing enough management information to, uh, to their governance committees, uh, and which then renders them uh, unable to really manage the risk and really set the risk up the same because they don't actually understand where the risks are or what's happening. So, you know, that might be a number of new clients they're onboarding, how many clients with that sanctions exposure, how many reports are they send into the National Crime Agency because of suspicious behaviour, whatever it may be. Um, and I think you know what we learned from the Sonali Bank case in 2016 very quickly was that information from the MLRO was not up, you're not going to see new management. He was not telling them that the controls weren't working well. He wasn't telling them that uh, he needed more resource he was giving them a mix. He wasn't giving them the message, you know, the true, accurate message. And ultimately, what that led to was the MLRO uh, actually personally being fined by the FCA along with the bank for actually not doing his job. So it's a real key responsibility. Make sure you're, you're uh, managing that message and giving that information. Yeah, I'm going to slip over that. Just. I guess the key takeaways just around accountability, as I mentioned earlier, senior management and the governance structures just taking ultimate overall accountability and responsibility um, for that, uh, for the controls. The corporate governance code is a really good starting point. If you're gonna be building a corporate governance structure, um, that's where to start. It gives a lot of good practice, uh, sort of good guides, along with board sort of effectiveness guidance. Really key if you wanna be building a, a really good strong uh, corporate governance model. It's got to be appropriate and proportionate to, to the firm, so you can't have the same corporate governance structure at HSBC, uh, at, at payment services firm where it, is, like, where it might be at uh, HSBC. It needs to be the right model for, for your firm. Information, information is key. Uh, always give as much data as you can information to make the informed decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you for both of our speakers. Uh, brilliant. Uh, it was very informative for us. Uh, thank you very much. And I will share the slides with you. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, if the recording is good, we will publish a, a post on the corporate responsibility and business ethics. Thank you very much. Thank you.